Thank you. I'm joining the Parks Committee, um, please rise for the pledge. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, we have called to the public. We have two cards, Jerry Van Gass. Thank you. This is a kind of an opening act for a busy day, I guess. So, uh, Jerry Van Gass, uh, 4610 East VA Estrella. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, I mentioned at the last meeting early December that I would be sending out a letter to uh, Parks Director and the City Manager. Uh, we're, we're asking the city to go out and hire an independent uh, director for the Parks and Preserve Initiative Fund, which now stands at $61 million in the ba as a balance and 30, over $30 million a year coming in, which is bigger than a lot of departments within the city. Uh, we think it deserves a specific manager. Uh, to date, there, is, there has been no single person entrusted with safeguarding this money, this fund. Uh, so consequently, the fund has been abused by previous parks directors uh, who have, you know, basically viewed the par this fund as a piggy bank. Uh, we think, uh, you know, independent manager of this fund is uh, imperative, you know, for the public trust. Uh, also, uh, you know, we need r real discussion about it, and we can't do it in two minutes here, so I'd like to see it on uh, either the agenda for next month or the month after, sometime uh, what, during the budget process. And then we would like to uh, have, we've got uh, uh, four, a uh, legal team of four attorneys that, uh, you know, are all on the same page that this is needed uh, for the public trust. It's a public initiative. We've seen what happened to the Heritage Fund at the state level. They stripped it away. The voters that voted for it, they took it away. And consequently, the state parks are in desperate shape. Uh, you know, I just want to close. The only reason I'm here is back in 2008, uh, I, I heard about 3PI. I didn't know about it until then. Proposition A was coming up to renew it for 30 years. So we're 19 years into this fund that's brought in almost $600 million we've spent. Uh, the only reason I got involved was friend of mine I was recruiting to campaign for Prop A and he said funny you mentioned that I, I was just appointed to the oversight committee and I said which constitutes what he said well we're told we have one meeting a year and to rubber stamp whatever the city gives us that's not oversight gang thank you Jerry Tim Sirikowski good morning my name is Tim Sirikowski to follow up with Jerry Van Gass I think we're at a point that we need more oversight. I think the use of 3PI money has been misused. A couple examples, taking money for golf courses, giving money to the zoo, where that was clearly a violation of the use of 3PI money. But more importantly is that when Grant Thornton was going to the meetings, he was never really explaining where the money was going. He was not telling the individuals here, this is where the money is going. In our lawsuit against the city, it was explained that Grant Thornton had knowledge of the money and knowledge of transfers for the golf course fund, but that they never really explained to the oversight committee what was going on. An oversight committee is supposed to make sure that the money is being spent correctly. What we're really requesting at the present time is that we get an individual in there that will just specifically look at 3PI money, handle the 3PI money, and make sure that the money is going to be spent the way it should be spent. I know it sounds like once in a while we're beating a dead horse to, uh, continually with this, but we still have 25 more years of spending of this fund, and we want to make sure that the people are being represented and that this money is being spent for their benefit. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Somebody like to move the minutes? 
Motion to approve. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, any? Ayes have it. Uh, consent items. Anybody want to pull anything off? Are you all good? All good. All right. So we want to make a motion. Motion to approve the consent items. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Ayes appear to have it. And do have it. Uh, number five. Anybody want to? Uh, um, any information? No. They're all information out. All right. Any of these other ones? Information only? No? No. No? All right. Fantastic. Uh, information discussion. Margaret Hans Park update. Margaret Hans Park. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, we'll start with a presentation and then questions absolutely fantastic good morning vice mayor members of the subcommittee uh, today we're here to hear an update on the status of Hans Park Margaret G Hans Park um, located in central Phoenix uh, I have with me Tim Sprague who is the representative of the Hans Park Conservancy and Larry Lazarus who is representing the Phoenix Community Alliance but first a brief uh, summary of the history of how Hans Park came to be uh, as you know it was the last link of the I-10 freeway that was built in the mid-1980s. Uh, in order to accomplish this project, ADOT needed to design a deck park that went over the freeway so traffic could obviously flow underneath it. This split the community, and so the, the IGA was developed to uh, develop a park and allow the city of Phoenix to manage the park, uh, which is on top of uh, the uh, deck. Uh, that was executed in 1988 so nearly 30 years ago. Um, and the park then was designed and built and opened in uh, 1992, and it was open to the public. Some background on, on how we uh, have, have arrived to this point today. In 2013, uh, there was a master plan initiated, primarily because of the development of ASU downtown, but also the growth of, of downtown Phoenix. And there was community interest for redeveloping the park to be something really iconic and something that people would come to Phoenix and no Phoenix score. In 2013 through 2015, there were several public meetings that were held to uh, look at what, or like a charrette, and see what uh, the community might want to see in that park and what it envisioned for the future. On April 28th of 2016, after two years of public input, the Parks Board did approve the Hans Park uh, Master Plan. This was a high level, it was a conceptual uh, idea. And it uh, was envisioned to be about $118 million to remake and, and make over this iconic park in downtown Phoenix. The master plan, uh, again, like I said, was conceptual. Uh, so then we embarked on a process to create a public-private partnership. Um, and that's the, the two individuals that I have here today that we'll talk in just a minute. And of that, uh, the coalition was created in 2017. And so in 2017, we needed also to refine our master plan. And so Hargraves Associates was uh, put on contract uh, to really kind of get into the details of what could actually be built um, based on the conceptual ideas. And the themes um, uh, across the conceptual idea remained the same. There was a plateau in the valley and, and the various uh, aspects that uh, they had mentioned in the, uh, in the previous uh, plan. And this is a picture of uh, what they have created and what was, uh, what was approved. And so uh, we took it back out to the community in uh, 2018, June. Um, and we took, again, more public input. And uh, the public, overwhelmingly, uh, we had uh, lots of people come to a public meeting to say, this is, we like this concept. We like the way it's going. Um, and so now we're going to go forward and, and start the actual um, design phases and the contract uh, to actually um, do the construction documents. So this is phase one, and phase one is the center part of, of the Hans Park. And again, you'll, you'll realize that it's bounded on uh, Third Avenue and Third Street, um, and also uh, to the North Portland, I'm sorry, sorry, to the South Portland, and Carver uh, to the, um, Culver to the um, North. And again, in the center there, you see the, the components that are really important to revitalize this park. Um, includes the firehouse, uh, which is directly across from Burton Bar Library to, to the south. Um, you'll see that there's a cafe um, envisioned uh, with a water spray ground, 
some tree groves, um, and a garden area. And so uh, these components uh, were very important uh, to, the, to the beginning of this process. And so like I said, we, we entered into a partnership with the Hans Park um, Conservancy and the Phoenix Community Alliance. We as a city uh, will manage the property and the construction and the programming. Hans Park Conservancy will help us with programming but also friend raising. And the Phoenix Community Alliance will be the leader in, in getting the, the, uh, the money that will help us realize this. The city has committed to $15 million over a three-year period. We're the second year into that, and the third year is coming. Um, but at this time, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Tim Sprague, who will talk about what the Hans Park Conservancy uh, has been doing uh, to further this process. And then after uh, Tim, Larry will talk about the fundraising efforts and where we're going with that for the future. So, Tim? Thank you. Vice Mayor, members of the committee. Um, here we go. Um, I'm a developer in downtown Phoenix. I've been doing development in the downtown for the last 15 years. And I'm president of the Hans Park Conservancy. Became involved with the park because of realizing that as Phoenix matures and our downtown grows, we've had the opportunity to have all the big rocks put into the jar. We have entertainment, we have sports, and we have education. And there was one last big rock that hadn't been put into the jar to make our great city a great city, and that's a great park. And so I became very involved in that some time back in terms of how that would work. Um, and I, what I want to do is talk about what's happened around the park, which I think is pretty interesting to note. In 2014, in a square mile around the park, there were about 1,500, excuse me, 5,900 people that lived in that square mile. Last year, at the end of 2018, there's now 12,000 people that live in that square mile around the park. It's kind of interesting to think that we've had exponential growth in that small area in just four years. Examples of that growth are shown here with the linear project that's on the corner of 3rd Street and Roosevelt, 104 units. Next is the Illuminate project, literally right across the street, 111 units. Next at Central and McDowell is the Muse, Muse project that Lennar Homes built, 367 units. Union at Roosevelt, at Central and Roosevelt, at 81 units, and Broadstone at 3rd Street and Roosevelt, 316 units. These are all for rent apartments that literally have been built in the last three years. Uh, they represent the best rental rates that happen in the city of Phoenix at this time. From a for sale perspective, this is the project that I built. It's called Portland on the Park. It's 149 units on the south side of Hans Park, overlooking the park. Uh, we averaged $420 a square foot sales price in that. And next is Enhance, which is on the east side of the park, of 49 units. Bottom line, this area has grown so much, we've had $350 million, literally, worth of development that has happened in the last three, three years. So what's happened in that is it's it set up what's to happen in the future. You've got another 1,464 units that are literally in the process of development now. And I know of items that are in the city right now in pre-development, another 2,000 units. So what's happened in our downtown is that we really have, have created a new community. And Hans Conservancy has been involved in how do you pull that together? Well, the Hans Park Conservancy consists of 20 um, neighborhoods, nonprofits, uh, the Japanese Friendship Garden, Irish Culture Center, and businesses around the park. We represent the community and we continue to help make this community grow and thrive. And what, I, what you're shown here is a slide of an event that we hold every year and it's called Noche en Blanco. If you imagine this, this is the largest dinner party that takes place in Phoenix and it's called a friend raiser, not a fundraiser. This is very, very reasonably priced for everybody to come to one evening, celebrate the community in downtown that has developed. Everybody's dressed in white. And it's an incredible experience to see. And I hope that hopefully you can see that next year if you can. So it's time now for us to bring that last big rock into the jar. And that's a great park for a great city. And I'm going to turn it to Larry Lazarus now, who is with Phoenix Community Alliance, to talk to you about how we in the private sector are teaming up with the public sector to have Hans Park become a great park. Larry? Thank you. Thank you, Tim. 
I've always wanted to rock. So uh, <laughs> let me uh, tell you. There you go. Let me tell you a little bit what's going on in the, uh, on the uh, fundraising aspect of it. I'm representing Phoenix Community Alliance. Phoenix Community Alliance's job is to try and raise money from the private sector uh, to uh, make this a reality. Uh, the past several months, we've been meeting with major philanthropic organizations, major corporations, just to get a feel of uh, what the uh, acceptability is and the participation opportunities are. Uh, recently, uh, we received a... Uh, uh, donation from the Arizona Community Foundation uh, funding uh, the uh, American Philanthropic Company who is going to work on the strategic aspect of raising, raising this money. Um, the American Philanthropic Organization uh, or Corporation uh, is headed up by Jeremy Beer who is behind me. Jeremy, if you can just wave. Uh, Jeremy's worked closely with a dozen, uh, dozens of philanthropic organizations, nonprofit clients uh, in the areas of strategic planning, message creation, program analysis and audits, major donor club uh, creation and implementation, direct mail, grant writing, and collateral material development. He is going to be working with us in developing this strategy, uh, including the development of the campaign conceptualization of the campaign message, and a survey, which we're going to be taking uh, right away, of major stakeholders that we've identified within the community. Uh, in addition, True North uh, has donated money uh, to allow us to hire uh, Joe Hickey from Crunch Time Advisors, who has extensive experiences in mar marketing, strategic planning, and business development, mostly in the sports and entertainment area. Uh, he was directly, he was vice president of the Arizona Super Bowl host committee and vice president of the college football championship game. You're going to raise your hand and wave if you haven't already done so. Uh, they are going to help us with a monthly retainer fee. Uh, we've given them a monthly retainer fee uh, for professional fundraising. They will fundraise beginning of March uh, and throughout the, the year uh, to try and uh, help us facilitate the, the fundraising aspect. Um, an economic uh, benefit study was done uh, back in uh, November of 2017. Uh, in that economic uh, study, it was determined that the park itself will increase visitation generation by about 80, 855,000 plus people to, to this facility uh, after we are able to, uh, uh, to uh, revitalize it and more than 22,760 new full-time jobs. But most importantly in this 30-year study, $6.6 billion will be additional spending. So this is not just an amenity, it is an actual generator of uh, income. And with that. Thank you, Larry and Tim. Uh, so our next steps um, are uh, to put out a, a revenue contract solicitation for the firehouse. And, and that, uh, this, this picture here is a depiction of what uh, the park would look like if the first phase was completed. You can see that there's a garden area, there's the cafe, and the firehouse and the plaza that uh, covers the center part. So this is a depiction of what it would look like with that first phase uh, developed. So again, the first step that we, we have is we're really pushing uh, hard to activate the firehouse. We're going to, in the next uh, several uh, weeks, put out a uh, revenue contract solicitation to, to get someone to uh, utilize that facility uh, for a restaurant, a full-service restaurant. And then construction manager at risk, uh, we are at the pre-submittal meeting uh, in the coming weeks. And so we're going to put somebody on contract to manage uh, the construction uh, once the funds are raised uh, to put towards this uh, first phase. We also are working with ADOT uh, to update our 50-year um, IGA agreement. Uh, that's good until 2038, but it's, it's really in a situation where it needs to be updated to allow us to uh, continue uh, the construction, but also uh, help them with any improvements they might need to make uh, for, the, uh, for the under part um, of the bridges. Uh, and then also the private fundraising, which Larry just spoke about. Uh, those are the next steps that we have, and, and with that, we'd like to answer any questions that you have about the, uh, the current update for uh, Hans Park. Thank you.
Thank you. We have a card, Luis Roman. Oh, yes. Yes, please. Thank you, um, Councilman Waring and members of the committee. My name is Louise Roman. I live at 1 East Lexington Avenue. I am represented by Councilman, Councilwoman Pastor of District 4, your previous chairman. Uh, Eric, uh, Inger Erickson is a passionate and smart leader. She has brought us together in this coalition with a great vision and to really revitalize this important asset that we have. It is a pivotal piece of Phoenix's history. This site is major in our state as well as our city. It has so many city assets around it that we have made investments in and that we continue to enjoy and see as crowns in the jewel of our city. And of course, we've also made investments in downtown uh, campus of ASU, biomedical, sports arenas, and burgeoning private development. These are all things that the city has been very pivotal in moving forward and supporting. So while Hans Park has stuttered, and it has stuttered, it is still here. It is well used, it is loved by the citizens, and it is the site of both locally grown as well as from away events. Um, so it is continuing to show its importance. And for nine years, nine years, a lot of us have worked on this project. Um, and I wanna tell you a story now. I was born and raised in a northern suburb of New York City. Oh, speakers have two minutes. I know, oh, okay. this is an important story, bear me out. My father was a Goldwater Republican and he was elected member of the town council. During his watch, there was an opportunity for the town to purchase a large swath of land for a public park. The opponents said, why this park? Everybody has a backyard. Well, guess what? Today, not everybody has a backyard. And that's why it's very important that you stay with us. With us. Government is the only entity that can really move this forward. We've got 3PI money, we've got possible bond money. You do not want this park to fail on your watch. Thank you. Great, any others? Nope, Councilman Nowakowski, you have uh... Well, yeah, this park happens to be in my district and it's been in my district since I've taken office. Um, back in 2010, we were actually looking at other means um, of using the park. Back in two, when I was first elected in 2008, we um, reallocated the Patriot Square to build um, cityscape that we have right now. And a lot of people were concerned about green space in downtown Phoenix. So the focus became Margaret Hans Park. A um, Couple concerns is that um, we have some, cons um, some producers of events like the um, McDowell Mountain Festival, and basically his concern is that he wants to make sure it's not limited for big events so that we need to keep that in mind too because if we're gonna be using this park now as the alternate um, location for big events such as the Super Bowl, Bowl event that we used to have on Block 23 that now we have a beautiful fries and uh, some housing and, and some businesses um, offices there that this needs to be a central park of, of the city of Phoenix that's used for everything. Another concern was um, more activities for teenagers. I know we talked about a skate park. Um, we, there was mention of basketball courts and stuff like that in the past, and that never got into the, um, the plan, but they were saying now more and more, you have young mix of families coming in. It's not just um, college students, but you actually have um, families moving into downtown, so to keep that in mind for the future. And then the other thing is allocating um, city properties like the um, fire station, a uh, great way to generate monies back to the park, but also um, we've been hearing from individuals out there that we need to start thinking outside the box of looking at other cities and what they have done. You know, um, an example would be like Austin, what they've done with the, um, with the food trucks. 
And one of the biggest problems that they have in Austin when we talk to them is their weather. It's either too humid in the, in the summertime or it's just rains and they have no place for cover. So they were saying that I asked the question, so if you had to do it all again, what would you have done? Um, basically built an indoor um, patio or indoor facility where people can actually go to the food trucks and eat indoors when it's too humid, there would be air conditioning. And when it was raining, they would have some kind of shelter and, and, and creating a cool, funky place where people would want to come. And the key behind it is affordable. How do you keep it affordable? Because one of the things that I hear when I go out there throughout the district, and especially in the downtown area, we have some of the best restaurants um, in the valley and in the state, and I believe in the country. But the affordability, and especially with so many young people and young adults going to ASU, U of A, and, 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 um, and um, NAU, that's downtown now, that they're looking for somewhere where they can, where they can hang out and that basically, and, and have fun. We um, complained about on um, Roosevelt and Third Street when we got rid of, um, what was it, Pas Cantina? And one of the things that we made sure is that the developer incorporates a Pas Cantina concept, but what was, what was so free flowing in the past where people were able to, to actually go out and just hang out. Now it's more modernized and it's not a place where you can just kick back. You, you have, it's more of a restaurant and it's ran more of a, a business. So how can we make sure that if we're gonna have a restaurant or, or a cafe on the park, that it serves both purposes, that we activate the park and at the same time, people can actually have a beer, have a sandwich, or have a meal, but it's affordable, but at the same time, um, it's different. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place where people want to go and experience. And I know with the expertise around this table, we can actually do all that. So those are some of the, the new concerns that were brought up. Um, to talk about how the, the funding came behind all this, it was our um, past city manager, David Cavazos. We were talking about creating um, First Street as a pedestrian mall. We didn't have the funding at that time because there was an economic downturn. So we looked at Adam Street as um, one of those streets that it's a gateway into our convention center and bringing people out into cityscape would be a great way to create some kind of a corridor. And then other people were saying, well, why can't we just use from the arena all the way to the park and create a pedestrian mall we didn't have the funding for it, but what we did do is we used paint and trees and sidewalks and we kind of narrowed the, um, the streets there and we created more of a pedestrian walkway and um, not a mall, but a walkway and it's, it's getting there. It's, um, we have small local businesses and a lot of those restaurants. And I think that's, that's where that whole concept came out. And then that's where their city manager ended up finding the funds to actually create some kind of a study to look into what can we do at Margaret Hans Park. So I just want to thank all those visionaries and also if we can look into the future that I think downtown is going to, it's more urban. Uh, we finally got our, our first grocery store and I think we, we filled in that last puzzle of the, of, of the urban um, downtown and I think what we need now is uh, to make sure that we have that open space that can relate to those young families, to the students that are, are studying in our universities in downtown, or those business individuals that want to take a walk or a break um, during work time, and also for individuals that want to just enjoy an outdoor concert or, or an opera or, or whatever, or moving in the park. So just to keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. May I respond? Please. Councilman Nowakowski, your vision is incredible. If we had a micro look at what was going on with the park, the McDowell Mountain Music Festival is a local uh, site that we all love and enjoy. The band shell or amphitheater that's being designed for this park, the one that's being erected actually has two purposes. One is to serve the smaller type of things that happen, McDowell Mountain Music Festival, or grows into the back of house. 
for a large festival to take place like what we've experienced over the, the March Madness, and, and that's there in the plans. The other thing is at the end of First Street, which you guys were very much involved in making that with the tree-lined streets, the firehouse is there, and the, the, the design of the firehouse has a big open space that would truly accommodate just what you said with the food truck. So I think everybody's right in line with where that vision is. One of the things I just want to make sure that it's affordable. I think that's one of the things that I'm seeing more and more young people and families going outside of the downtown mm -hmm. corridor into the 16th Street, 7th Avenues, and all that because the affordability of, of some of the restaurants. And, and I'm not saying that we need to downgrade the, the type of food. No, we have some excellent restaurants downtown and, and the best food in, in, in the city, right? But I think that we need to have that diversity also, that, that it's different and it's um, diverse, right? Hard for me not to respond. <laughs> um, the cafe uh, on the, the west side of the park is really about the residents and the community. The cafe is on that side. The ability to have affordable uh, opportunity for uh, dining and for lunches and things like that are right there. All, also, the fields that are open, uh, which can include basketball, include those kinds of things for the community, the opportunities are there. Uh, skate park, uh, we had to, uh, we had to uh, take a look through Hargraves as to what could be built there and what the stress levels could be above the freeway. And so the amount of cement, uh, the, there will be a skate, skating opportunity, but it won't be that full kind of concrete skate park uh, because of the uh, infrastructure issues, but we're we're right on board with the exact kinds of things that you were talking about. I just want to make sure that I'm advocating for those individuals that come to our office with just some concerns, saying, "Well, we didn't have an input." Yes, you do. I'll bring it to the committee. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Any more? No. All right. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. All right. Item nine. Read on. Read on. Good morning, Vice Mayor Waring and members of the subcommittee. <clears throat> Amy Corvo and I both chaired the Read on Phoenix initiative. Uh, and Amy and I will be providing the presentation today. First, I'd like to lay the foundation as to why Read on Phoenix is critical to our <clears throat> community. According to the U.S. Department of Education National Center of Education Statistics, the percentage of students in Arizona reading at grade level on NAEP was 30% in 2017. This test is actually taken every two years and we'll have new data at the end of 2019. Of the 25 school districts serving elementary school students in Phoenix, we actually only have six, uh, six districts uh, that have students reading at grade level above 50%. And to put it a little bit into per perspective, there are 15,000 third grade students not reading at grade level in Phoenix alone, which would fill Wells Fargo Arena Plus. <clears throat> to further lay the foundation, the graphs uh, illustrate Arizona's all students reading at grade level. So we have a positive trajectory from when AZ Merit was first released in 2016, um, and right now we're at 44%. The city of Phoenix, however, is below the average of all students in Arizona. Right now in 2016, when the initiative, when this specific strategic plan started in 2016, we were at 30%, 33%, now we're at 37%. So we, we are seeing a positive trajectory, but we are still not where we would like to be. When you look at actually economically disadvantaged students, we're even further below. Um, right now we're at 31%. And this is where really we target our initiative and our programs to target economically disadvantaged students. I'm going to hand it over to Amy Corvo, my co-chair for Read on Phoenix, to talk about the Read on Phoenix initiative. 
Vice Mayor Waring and um, members of the council. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Read On initiative and the work that we are doing to ensure that every child has the skills and resources necessary for third grade reading achievement. As you can imagine, um, we don't do this alone. We intend to close the learning gap by 2020 among economically disadvantaged youth by increasing reading proficiency by 80%. Uh, this initiative started in 2013. We are going to, they are currently on our second strategic plan in order to do this, and we'll be bringing together community and, um, members and partners to look at our third community um, plan in the near future. From that plan and the work that we did with the community, we identified really three areas in which the work of the city and um, can address these. One is with our school readiness. Um, the second is the out of school time, literacy enrichment. And third is around family engagement. So three, these three strategies were created as the uh, core to ensure that our initiative meets um, our goals. I just wanted to mention a few of the partners that we have that are committed to this work. Um, we uh, also partner and get seek advice and work from the United Way, colleagues from Southwest Human Development, Stand for Arizona, uh, Stand for Children Arizona, First Things First, Thriving Together, our partners in the library, and Unite for Literacy. Some of those members are here today, so we just would like to take this opportunity to thank them for their continued work um, in helping us achieve our goals. So I will pass this back over to Tim to tell you a little bit more detail of the initiative. And while Amy mentioned, while Amy mentioned our core partners, we do bring together more than 30 organizations across Phoenix at least twice a year to really look at best practices and what's happening across the, uh, across the country. But the uh, one thing that I would like to recognize, especially with our team, is that we've been a recipient, uh, one of 29 communities across the nation that has been awarded the Paysetter Award from the National Campaign for Grade Level Reading. We've actually received this award for the past three years based on the ability of the local community demonstrating progress in alignment and collaboration for impact on early school success in early grades and early years. So we're very proud of being the recipient of, the, of this award. Uh, very few communities get recognized across the country. And, and again, we've received this award the past three years. But over the last couple of years, I did want to mention some of our successes that we've had in our community. Most recently, Phoenix was selected as one of six cities in Arizona to launch the Read On Acceleration Zone project which really intends to get the community involved, nonprofits, school district, educators, government agencies, and community leaders who share the commitment to and focus on achieving school readiness and third grade reading goals. This particular project will be concentrated in the Cartwright School District as the accelerated zone. And the reason why Cartwright District was chosen within Read On Phoenix based on Read On Arizona is that they have two bright spots in that community where they're beating the odds and our, our school administrators are getting third grade readers uh, at grade level. We were also a recipient, Read on Phoenix, of a statewide grant from the National Center for Family Learning uh, to bring programming, professional development, and digital access of books to a Phoenix urban school district. This was written by Read on Arizona along with Read on Phoenix. Read on Arizona again identified Cartwright as a recipient of this particular project just based on the bright spots that are happening in that specific district. The major partners of this grant are the Department of Education, Read on Phoenix, Make Way for Books, Unite for Literacy, and Southwest Human Development. Other successes that have happened based on the work of our partners uh, in our library, we have expanded kindergarten boot camp. Um, at one point in time, it happened in North Phoenix. Now it's being offered citywide, where this is a very successful program in our library department, which really targets school readiness to ensuring that families who do not have access to Head Start or Early Head Start, but also offer this course of workshops for our families. Again, uh, recently, uh, in Youth and Education and Human Services launched four family resource centers. We are still working on launching those centers. Those centers are called Phoenix Families First, and they're strategic throughout um, 
throughout the city of Phoenix. Another a successful program of, under Read on Phoenix is our Experience Corps after school tutoring program. We were lucky enough to receive two uh, grants for this particular program. We are a recipient of the AmeriCorps grant, so we, have, we can deploy at least 50 individuals in our community that are targeting uh, third grade reading specifically. So we're very excited to be a recipient of that uh, particular grant. We're also going to be a recipient of a Department of Justice grant around mentoring through our AARP Foundation. So again, that is to scale our tutoring program that has seen some great success in our classroom that matches volunteers uh, with students to increase reading levels. Our last program, we partner with a company out of Colorado called Unite for Literacy. They provide books for families. Um, we have launched a new program called Unite for Growing Readers uh, that we targeted the West Valley in particular to get at least 100 books into family homes. Research shows that the more books we have in the home, the likelihood, regardless of economic status, their scores do increase. So we're very excited about launching this particular program, and we do want to scale each one of these programs across the city of Phoenix. That is our presentation today. If you have any questions, we'd love to answer them. Questions? Comments? Comments? Uh, Tim and Amy, I absolutely, I am 100% wholeheartedly behind this project. I remember when it was first started and to see how much it's grown and really impact many of the families citywide has really been just amazing to witness. Um, I'm excited to see the, the family engagement piece. I know how crucial that is and not just investing and in making sure that our students have the resources they need to be successful, but that also definitely impacts families. So I was just wondering in terms of um, the family engagement piece, how, what opportunities are there for parents or mothers and fathers to learn any learning development skills that are needed to be able to help facilitate the child's learning uh, process at home outside of school? Um, Vice Mayor and Councilwoman Givetta, we have been doing a lot of work, kind of, um, especially I would focus on the Phoenix Families First. Okay. This is going to allow us to expand oh, beyond the families that we serve in our Head Start program to help them access the support they need. I don't want to use professional development, but we are going to be looking to offer parenting classes. We are going to be releasing um, to look for a parenting curriculum. We have partners of Phoenix Children's Hospital that are helping to provide throughout the city some work around for families who may have a need for um, addressing trauma or behavior. There is a menu of opportunities that families can experience. We're trying to help match families where they are with the services they need. Um, so that's done through both Tim's program, my program, and um, a lot of our collaborative partners. That's awesome. Wonderful. And if I could have some of that information to also share with our residents and families, including any opportunities to be volunteer. I want to volunteer myself however I can after school. Um, if I can get some of that information to help share, that'd be wonderful. Absolutely. Michael. So Tim, one of the biggest um, concerns I have is summer break. We have such a long period of time where we, um, the children aren't reading at home and they're not actually in school. Are there any special summer programs that we can recommend or we can kind of advocate um, to make sure that that kids keep on reading and that they don't lose that summer break as an opportunity to not continue their they're reading. There are numerous programs within our library department that will and do reinforce, especially the importance of literacy. We can definitely get that information to you. Our parks department offer various programs at our community centers and youth centers, um, and uh, we will, we can, and work with them to ensure that literacy is happening. We have. Um, we have received some funding to scale our program. In particular, summer learning is part of our out of, out of school time literacy enrichment. And so the grants that we are receiving from the Department of Justice as well as uh, the ARP Foundation is for the after school time. And we, can, we are definitely looking at the summer space. All righty. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any more? No. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Any more calls to the public? Any future agenda items? Um, Vice Mayor, you know, one of the things that I think that people really don't understand is the three PI funds. I know that in my district, we have a lot of these neighborhood parks and we have a lot of older parks that we use three PI actually to improve those parks. 
and to hear someone come up here and saying that we're misusing that funding, I kind of take offense to it because um, I know that the parks um, individuals director actually comes to me and says, Michael, um, what are some of the concerns you're hearing out there in the parks? And this is where we're getting the funding to actually help out in those older neighborhoods and those older parks. And um, I just want to make sure that when people are watching the, the television or Channel 11, that they don't get a wrong impression that the parks just have, um, they can actually allocate this money wherever they want. I think that there's different channels and this subcommittee is a fine example of one of those channels that they have to go through. And I believe it's through the parks some board also. And I believe there's a committee out there. So I think just for clarification that we should have an explanation of what the process is. And throughout all the districts, how, many di how we benefit from the three PI monies too. Excellent. Why don't we uh, why don't we go ahead and do that, and maybe we can have sort of a preliminary discussion about kind of what three pi is and so forth, and then uh, lead into that. And then I assume the citizens can come, and if they have questions, uh, we can bounce those questions off of our experts. Thank you, Anya. Yep. All right. I think we're all good. Thank you very much. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.